Hello everybody. I was very much looking forward to the publication of a book on degrowth titled The Future is Degrowth, a guide to a world beyond capitalism. It will be available from Versa Books on June 28th. I reached out to one of the authors of the book, Aaron Van Singen. He gracefully accepted my invitation to interview him. Aaron is one of the editors of unevenearth.org, which is a website whose tagline is where the ecological meets the political. He completed a PhD at Burbank University of London on green gentrification. He did his master's at McGill University in Montreal. He is from Belgium and lives in Montreal, Canada. Stay with me for our interview recorded on June 17, 2022. If you wish and if you can support my independent work on promoting a good life after capitalism, please go to my Patreon page or you can buy me a coffee. Links below. And now let's watch the interview with Aaron Van Singen. I'm here with Aaron Van Singen. Uh, he's one of the authors of The Future of Degrowth, A Guide to a World Beyond Capitalism that will come out from Verso Books very soon. And I am very excited to uh, talk to you, Aaron. Uh, this is a book that I've been looking forward to reading and seeing for a long time. It's been talked about a lot in the degrowth community. And I'm a, a huge degrowth supporter. I'm new to the, uh, the field, but I'm so excited and I like to explore as much as possible from the field. Um, so I have prepared some questions for you. You have seen them in advance, so uh, we can go over them one by one. And if we have time, we can go into a few more shorter ones. Um, so uh, let's start. So um, you define degrowth as a democratic transition to a society that, in order to enable global ecological justice, is based on a much smaller throughput of energy and resources that guarantees a good life and social justice for all, and that does not just depend on continuous expansion. So my question for you is, how would you translate this definition for a Canadian family who has a large house in the city, a cottage by the lake, buys from Amazon and Costco regularly, flies two, three times a year to overseas vacation destinations, heats the house with natural gas, and all the delicious perks of a consumer society. What do they need to do to adapt to a society based on degrowth? I think you pinpoint the problem really well um, with that example. So the family you describe might think of themselves as maybe middle class or upper middle class, but they are part of the global probably one to five percent of most affluent consumers who individually, compared to everyone else in the world, have a higher emissions and impact um, than the other 95%. So what we argue in the book um, and what most people in the degrowth movement argue is that uh, though degrowth would likely um, would need to come with an increase in well-being, an increase in public goods for everybody, um, there are a lot of things, a lot of kinds of lifestyles that will need to change. So I would say to this family, um, probably a lot of things that you do will have to change, but degrowth would be kind of a way to make it possible for those kinds of changes to be accepted by people. So um, to create a society that is filled with opportunities for leisure that aren't carbon intensive. Um, or uh, to allow a society that um, where they can have a house um, and they're given subsidies to be able to um, make their house as uh, little um, fuel intensive or um, energy intensive as possible. So um, yes, uh, people will need to um, change their way of life. Um, but that might actually create space for a lot more, um, a lot of different other kinds of uh, 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 satisfaction in life and well-being. And yeah, um, yeah. yeah, it totally ma it makes sense. And 
Uh, maybe a, just a quick um, side note to this. I had in mind for this question a report that came out from the Harder Kohl Institute in Berlin about the 1.5 degrees lifestyle. And they do talk about the footprint, you know, of uh, people in Canada in a number of countries. And Canada stood out in that report um, by having about 14 tons of CO2Es per person per year, while the target needs to go to about 2.4 in 80 years by 2030. So, so again, like you said, it's an average. Um, stratification, social stratification means not all of us will have the same footprint, but some of us do have to change like, like you said. So that was the background for that question. So um, I would like to ask now, how did you discover the growth or did it discover you? <laughs> yeah, it, um, I would say that uh, degrowth discovered me. Um, I, I, so at the, um, when I first learned about it, I was studying food banks in Canada um, and kind of the history and how they came about. And I was also volunteering at food banks. Um, and I kind of came to the conclusion that these food banks started exist uh, came into existence for two main reasons. One is as the welfare state ret retreated, uh, food provision, emergency food and emergency resources was kind of left to the private charity sector, um, starting in the 1970s. But also at the same time, the industrial food system centralized and uh, became inherently wasteful. Um, so it has to overproduce in order to manufacture a kind of abundance. Um, but then that overproduced food has to be discarded to man manufacture scarcity. Um, and so that all seemed crazy to me. And then um, in 2014, I moved to Barcelona um, with my partner who was doing a master's there for a year. And I kind of fell into this degrowth community um, that um, it all, like what I had studied just started being articulated in into a framework. Um, and I wouldn't say that at any point that I have like a, like, uh, this is crazy. What's the concept that I'm looking for to describe it? But it just kind of was thrust on me in, in some I'll way. Pop um, out for you. <laughs> yeah. Was it yeah. at ICTA you, you found the, um the people okay yes yeah so. that's right yeah so that that was the institute of um science uh and technology um in in barcelona in barcelona okay yeah. so sounds great that's that's amazing just a, maybe a quick background for me i was reading jason hickel's book in uh, 2020 uh and it it, it struck me um um, especially the numbers about the structure adjustment programs at the Global South divide, the numbers in financial aid. I did not realize the extent of the divide, um, but at that moment I did not click with the word itself. I maybe clicked with the notion and the numbers, so it took me two or three more books and surprisingly it was Tim Jackson that awoke me to this, even though he's not like a specifically degrowther. And then I came back to the word itself and a whole worldview opened. <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, that's why I'm so excited to see the, your book came out. Um, so this leads me to my, the second question, which is um, uh, mostly about chapter two uh, from the book, The Economic Growth. Um, so maybe you can tell us what is wrong with the current paradigm of growth and Perhaps more specifically, why is it so difficult for the average person to imagine life, business, and an economy that does not depend on perpetual expansion? Yeah, this is a really good question, and I, I, I kind of want to start by and like answering um, just more immediately is um, and and maybe out uh, a bit on, of an aside from what we talk about in the book, but. I think there, um, there's this kind of situation that we live in today, which you could call a dictatorship of the present, where yes. the present, it seems like there is no alternative to what to any other option. But that's because a lot of the alternatives um, are have been systematically destroyed, and and that's not just you know you could think of communism as being an example of an alternative, but 
also alternatives in the day-to-day -day life of, of people living in a capitalist economy, like um, any kind of mutual aid, um, association, commons, like these are often criminalized, the public sphere, um, any kind of different way of engaging with people becomes uh, be becomes illegal often. Um, and so a lot of people live in this kind of world of, of scarcity. Um, and and so when you start saying, well, it could be totally different, um, we, we could we could actually have a world of of um, of, of abundance. Um, pe people don't want to believe you. And also, um, they, 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 they have no reason to believe you because, because nothing in people's experience suggests that there is an alternative out there. Um, so then talking specifically about what we argue in, in the second chapter around what is wrong with the current paradigm of growth, um, one thing that we talk about is that, well, th this idea of economic growth is, is actually super recent. Um, and it, it was introduced kind of in this post-war environment where um, before that, no one ever talked about economic growth and no one ever even talked about the economy as a thing you could measure. Um, people measured unemployment or um, different kinds of um, indicators for well-being, but economic growth wasn't a thing. Um, so it was actually a very new thing, and it, it actually came about as um, these capitalist economies led by the United States were trying to prove um, their, their um, dominance and their, their, uh, how much better they were than, than uh, communist economies. Um, and, and so that's around when the growth paradigm emerged as uh, a way to um, satiate the working class to say, well, um, you know, you can have what you want, um, but we need to grow first, but you need to let capitalism yep. do its thing. Um, but then if we go back further, it's clear that this kind of ideology, this paradigm, um, this hegemonic paradigm that we call it, um, it has its roots in, in things like the colonialist um, history, in, in um, a, the emergence of a patriarchal economy where women's work is devalued. Um, so we start by saying it's a very new thing, but then we say it has these roots in, in other things. But then what we then talk about is we say, the, one of the main problems of growth is that it kind of captures everyone, including the working class, into this constant treadmill of, of production where yep. you're constantly trying to, to get ahead. Um, but in doing so, um, you actually lose a lot of um, things that could make you happy. And um, yeah. Yeah, it, it makes sense. And I'm, I'm wondering if you see a connection between between this mentality and imaginary with uh, Chomsky's idea of manufacturing consent and the whole McCarthyism, did it have an effect on, on people's perception of the need of, for growth? Absolutely. I, I think there's a really big connection there that maybe okay. um, there could be more, um, more um, investigation in that. Um, but I, I think something that happened is where it became really convenient for the Western, um, as the Western working class grew into the Western middle class, it became really convenient for them to, uh, um, uh, for, for culture, um, cultural production to kind of create this identity um, mm -hmm. of, of um, identification with growth and, and with its importance. Um, yeah. Uh yeah, yeah. So, so it totally makes sense. Um, so, the the next chapter deals with the critiques of growth. Um, so, from from the critiques of growth mentioned in the book, I will just briefly cover them: ecological, social, economic, culture against capitalism. Just using my own words here: uh, feminist in industrialization and the north-south divide. And I'm skipping the right-wing critique for now. <laughs> 
Um, so which one do you think resonates with uh, the most with the people in North America and Europe? Um, in the sense that which story can we tell people in rich countries about growth to make them switch to degrowth faster? So this is like strategizing the, the narrative a little bit. <laughs> so I'll answer that with um, what I find in, in the workshops I've done and in the conversations I've had is that um, actually a lot of people identify with the cultural critique um, okay. a lot. So just to give a, a short story as an example, when I was first um, studying degrowth, and when I first came across it, and I was kind of excitedly posting about stuff, and my a friend of mine, Catherine, sent me this message saying, degrowth, amazing. Um, can, let's meet up to talk about it. Um, and it That's how out I feel was, now, <laughs> <laughs> by the way, yeah. Uh, yeah it sorry. turned out that she was like, um, she, she was going through a personal crisis. She felt like mm -hmm. she was trying to work. She was trying to like make a living. And at the same time, she was trying to um, develop her artistic career. And, and, and she, she felt like she was like overwhelmed basically. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and this was when I was first learning about degrowth. So I said, well, you know, uh, let me um, tell you, um, degrowth is about reducing the total metabolism of uh, shrinking total and i think i i feel like as i remember as i was talking in these very technical terms i lost her um yeah. because when when she saw the word she most identified with actually this feeling of like being on a constant treadmill and and yeah. and feeling like she is being pushed to grow and and pushed to have like a, a career and a um, at, while at the same time feeling very alienated from from her surroundings, from from these kind of um, ideas of what we're supposed to do, but also at work, like she felt totally um, like unable to find satisfaction in in in, the, in her place of work. So since since then, like whenever I talk about degrowth. Um, I kind of um, have noticed that a lot of the time when people, when I ask people like, how would degrowth change your life? Or, or, or how does the growth economy affect you? It, people respond by saying things like, I feel overwhelmed. I feel uh, totally um, uh, like I don't identify with, with um, what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, I, I can't, keep up um like i i feel like i'm being told to like make money and at the same time i need to be able to like be happy and and i just can't balance all of these things um and feeling totally disconnected from from their work um and and yeah like i i think that is actually kind of um something that if, if you if you talk to anybody like um from from someone who works at an amazon distribution center to uh um let's say like a, a ceo of a tech company you might actually have like some like that might be a way that those two people could share a discussion where they would say i feel totally overwhelmed like i feel like i'm on a constant treadmill um and so, yeah, so I yeah. do find that the cultural, cultural perspective is 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 um, one that people identify with a lot. Yeah, th this is a bit surprising. I, I wasn't sure what you would answer, and it it makes me think of the that fam now famous Buck Buckminster Fuller quote that you need to build a new system first, and which makes the old system obsolete. So it's sounds to me it feels that uh, the main task of the growthers is to build this new narrative the new stories make them interesting fun and cool and then people just forget about the pressures of capitalism of growth of uh, careers and social climbing um, mm -hmm. do you think there's a room for fiction in this uh, area so something more contemporary not just Ursula Le Guin and something more 
specific to degrowth? This is a new question, so <laughs> it's new to you. Absolutely. Kind like, of having I'm, fun with I'm it a, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a, personally, I, I grew up on, on science fiction and on mm -hmm. fantasy. Um, and uh, going back to what I just said, I've, because I've been, and you know, uh, working as a freelance editor in the last five years, I've found myself extremely dissatisfied. Um, constantly feel like I, I'm like not doing enough. Um, and, uh, like I have been working on my own science fiction writing, um, as part of that. So like, I, I absolutely like when I work on uh, the science fiction stories, it like allows me to actually find a way to imagine what um what a degrowth society could look like um and so I'm, I'm a really big believer in 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 utopian narratives um, yes and and how it, so in degrowth people talk a lot about um the the creation of desire um how how could someone if desire is around you know owning a house two cars traveling, uh, taking the airplane, if that having a crew, uh, yachts, um, if that is what people desire now, um, if that's the social goal, um, how can we create a new narrative of desire of, of what um, a different kind of um, livelihood could look like that isn't based on externalizing uh, impact on and isn't based on being inherently exclusive to those who can't access that. Um, so now a more, uh, possibly a more difficult question, which, which is um, whether we can have the growth without getting rid of capitalism, as we know it, and without class conflict between the ruling class and the rest of us. And my ruling class I not, don't just mean the 1%, but the political class and so on. So in our in our book, we argue that degrowth is a pathway. Um, in the subtitle, we say it's a pathway yes. to post capitalism. So we maintain, and um, we uh, we also have found that um, even through surveys, the majority of the degrowth community um, uh, is is uh, basically promotes that we need to move beyond capitalism. Um, yeah. There are there is I wouldn't say that. Um, degrowth as a whole um, is on board with that. There's a lot of different people coming at it from different perspectives, um, but we make the claim that it has to be um, yeah. a, a post-capitalist uh, system. And um, yeah, sorry. So, so sorry. So, would you define capitalism as uh, in the neoliberal sense, as markets, deregulation, prices, and all that? Is that what you have in mind? No, well, I, would, I would kind of have a more, um, I guess, Marxist definition where it's, it's okay. about the creation of, of um, private property and then the development of markets that trade those uh, uh, commodities that, that um, on, on, a, on a global market. Um, so capitalism is is kind of like a a system which which depends on on the, the commodification of of goods um that could otherwise belong to everybody um, yeah so 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 makes sense um so we can probably move on to um about the changes that degrowth proposes um so the book speaks about uh, transformation of changes in six areas i'll just list them quickly so democratizing the economy, redistribution and social security, democratizing technology, re-evaluation of labor, democratization of social metabolism. I like the social metabolism um, and international so solidarity. So each one I know it's a huge subject. That's why people have to read the book. Uh, so from all these and the many now, uh, policies that are listed in the literature, I'll pick just five for, for the purpose of our conversation. So working less, like 21 hours per week, 
universal basic income, universal basic services, workplace democracy, one of my favorites. Um, so for the people watching, that means having the power to hire and fire a boss, <laughs> to be very specific, and maximum income or caps on wealth. So if grassroots movements and governments implemented, let's say just these five policies, just these five, for the next five to 10 years, do you think we would be on an irreversible path towards the growth with no way back? <laughs> I know it's a that, big it, question, but you take your time and pick whatever yeah. you want from it. <laughs> uh, I think that's a really, it's a good question. Um, so in, I, I think in the left, in the past few years, there's kind of emerged this um, idea that if, if we picked a few kind of like key uh, policies to kind of organize around, um, yeah. they, these would allow for this kind of like gear shift of capitalism to bring about yeah. like a, a, a new system. Um, I would say by and large that degrowth um, proponents um, kind of come from a different perspective. So like you could think of it as like um, either having these po like a few policies like on the rocks or uh, the degrowth perspective, which is like more of a cocktail of policies where yep. you will probably have to mix and match and try different things. Um, however, um, we kind of in our book, we use this um, term, uh, which was uh, promoted by Andre Gortz, the French philosopher which he called a non-reformist reform. So these are reforms that kind of have this capacity that when you put them in place, they make a whole new thing possible. So to take, for example, um, working 24 hours per week. Okay, all of a sudden people have 20 extra hours to uh, do their thing, to, to get groceries, buy food, um, hang out in the park, um, uh, relax, go to a community meeting, uh, maybe start uh, going to their uh, union events, um, maybe taking doing some taking some courses. Um, so all of a sudden, that might make way for a much more um, engaged society. Um, yeah. So there are ways that these policies can have um, a, a kind of trigger effect. Um, but I would say that by and large, um, the, uh, degrowth perspective is that, um, it's not just one because they need to balance each other. So for example, if you switch, um, to 21 hours per week of work, people might spend their long weekends, uh, flying around or yep. something like that. Yep. So there actually needs to be a balance where, um, where, uh, where these policies need to be part of a wider package, I guess. Um, to, the, uh, to this note, to this specific um, idea of uh, the risk uh, of certain policies, do you think you can offset some of them uh, with, uh, with caps, with rationing and ratio, uh, ratio policies on consumption like carbon or miles travels and things like that w would they work uh, maybe just a bit of history I, I grew up in Romania and I lived with um, uh, grocery ration cards so we had uh, half a bread per family per day or this many grams or liters of oil and sugar per month um, that uh, limited consumption, but it induced this um, aversion towards scarcity. And once mm -hmm. communism disappeared, everybody wanted to buy as much as possible from as, from as many sources as possible. Um, so yeah, back to, to what you just said, uh, would uh, rationing work in any way? No, I think- Under the growth? Um... I think no one in the degrowth movement is is suggesting any kind of thing like rationing, um, and, and you could see that 
today where, for example, in Ecuador and France, when the government did put in place um, kind of a, a, a fuel price hikes, which mm -hmm. were yep. tied to um, uh, kind of car carbon pricing um, initiatives, it, enormous, enormous protests, because what yep. those tend to do is they, they affect the poor the most. Um, yes. And and they also uh, they breed resentment towards uh, towards people who might uh, actually afford um, to to have um, because in any society there are people who are better off and people who are not. So um, what what the degrowth proposal tends to, what degrowthers tend to propose is is that they say. Um, you, uh, for example, um, you could pair it with something like an ecological tax reform, um, where okay. instead of being taxed on your income, if your income is above a certain level, um, so let's say your middle, upper middle class, then you start being taxed on, let's say, um, uh, how many times you fly per year, um, stuff like that. So it would actually affect the highest tier um, of society, but not uh, the lowest um, tier of society. So some sort of a progressive consumption tax. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. I would like to ask you now about levels of applying degrowth in society. And the book talks about degrowth at multiple social levels, from community to state level, uh, with different policies and strategies. I'm getting questions. I talk to people in the community, and they they keep asking me, so how can I do degrowth here, like in, in Toronto? So the question would be, so what can an urban community like Toronto or Montreal, where you live, do according to degrowth, independently from the state and authorities, and what they can do with the help from local and federal authorities? And now, just a bit about activism. So if social and local activism is enough, to tr trigger the change or we actually have to pick up pitchforks and go to big banks or blow up pipelines? Yeah, so in, in our book, we, we did dedicate a chapter to, um, to this question of like, you know, we could talk about degrowth in these as abstract ways. We could talk about these policies that kind of for most people are a bit out there. Um, yeah. What is a way that you could um, enact degrowth as an individual. Like, how could you um, do it yourself? Um, one one thing that I think we could start with is that um, uh, try to do something not just as an ind individual, but join a group that's doing something, or or, or make it about beyond yourself. Because we're often told, oh, you know, uh, just buy recycled toilet paper, or shower less. These are individual individualizing solutions they kind of isolate us but probably if if to take an extreme example if you lay down on a on a runway uh for five minutes um and you stopped uh 10 airplanes you would probably have a better impact on your carbon footprint than if you bike to work every day for the yeah. rest of your life so uh, try to think of it as uh beyond yourself and and join a group um and then i quickly drew this um but in the book you could possibly yes see. yeah it's we can a see. triangle yeah um on the top there's the non-reformist reforms and then on the bottom there's the ruptural strategies yep. and the navtopias um can you maybe just uh, put down the the book so we can see the top um we we, we couldn't see the, the top yeah. yes and ruptural strategies. Yes, it's perfect. Yes. Thank you. Um, and so we kind of introduced this this framework where um, it, we I already talked about these non reformist reforms, um, but it's these different kinds of actions that all could be part of degrowth um, and could actually inform each other. So I can very quickly just go sure. through them. So we have the non-reformist reforms, which are these policies that could actually make a di big difference once they're enacted. And you could do that on the local level. You could say, um, push push your um, uh, 
push your municipality to whenever they build new social housing, it has to be uh, 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 sustainable, low energy housing, or it has to have uh, some kind of uh, renewable energy production that goes with it. Or um, you could push your municipality to set up, uh, let's say, a energy cooperative where um, people can uh, buy solar panels and then uh, sell it on the grid collectively as a community, for example. Yep. Um, then you have now topias. And so degrowth uh, really centers this. So now topias is, is um, utopias that exist in the here and now. Um, and so this could be anything from uh, a collective housing um, or a, a, a workplace that has been turned into a cooperative. Um, so where all the workers own it, or it could be a community garden um, where people get together and grow food together and learn from each other. In, yeah. Interject quickly, are transition towns part of this example? And maybe you can elaborate a little bit about transition towns? Absol yeah. Absolutely. So uh, the transition town movement is this movement where uh, with a kind of key set of like guiding principles, um, and, and just like strategies, um, people can kind of turn their municipality into a more um, democratic and a more uh, environmentally just um, community. Um, so a lot of municipalities around the world are uh, people are, are organizing and, and there's kind of like a if you look it up, there's a movie, there's a book. Um, with kind of like a guide of how you as an individual could start doing that. Um, and so now topias are really important, not because like you could maybe imagine like the more people do now topias, suddenly everything becomes now topia, it, like this kind of gradual thing. It's not really that because no one really imagines that, you know, local change has that um, kind of path. What it more is, is that if we go back to what we talked about of the dictatorship of the present, um, you, you notice that something is different. Um, this is a cooperative, like what, what does that mean? People, oh, people can make decisions together. Now you suddenly you can think, oh, we could actually do things differently. Um, and then when a crisis hits or, or, or some kind of different, um, uh, uh, some political party takes um, enters enters um, the government. All of a sudden, people have an idea of what a different way of doing things could be like, and then they can actually make it real. Um, so now, topias are necessary to create desire for change. Um, and then the ruptural strategies, um, these kind of what we call counter hegemonic strategies, is is it's more about uh, you could think of it as picking up your pitchforks, um, but it, it's really about these kinds of things aren't really possible unless people are organized and working together to not just demand change, but make different kinds of power possible. So that could be like organizing as a, a neighborhood or as on your block to make demands of your city but also all of a sudden change the way that government works so that you actually can um, control what happens in your community um, and you could actually have a say. But so ruptural strategies could also include things like blockades. Um, so you, would, you could include like the indigenous blockades of, of, of pipelines um, or uh, it could also include uh, workplace strikes uh, where people stop working to show actually we have power and we need to have uh, a satisfying life and enough um, enough income so that we can actually um, in like have a decent living um, so those strategies kind of all work together and and reinforce each other um, because without the ruptural strategies even if you elect the nicest person to office, the coolest, most progressive person, without a ruptural um, social movement that, that really forces 
um, the, the, uh, the social body to, to have to make changes, that nice person is going to be totally ineffective. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, thank you for that. And maybe just a quick note on this. I managed to get a, a degrowth memo I wrote into the hands of Jack Mead Singh. Uh, so for people out there, he's the leader of one of the major parties in Canada. So he knows the word, he cannot unknow it now. <laughs> so, Amazing. Yeah, so you planted that's a, a small seed. Yeah, it's a small seed and I'll try to uh, reach out to more and more uh, politicians. Um, so maybe this is one way to uh, spread the word and like you said, plant the seeds. Uh, so what you just said, it's a segue to my next question, because I always have in mind the people that live in a box, the, the, let's say the capitalist box, uh, with all its imaginary. I have many friends that live in that box. <laughs> I used to live in that box for many years myself. I know degrowth is big on conviviality, sufficiency, simplicity, frugality, reflection, consensus, deliberation, collaboration, culture jamming counter-hegemony, like you said, and especially emancipation of women. I think this is not addressed enough, the feminist aspect. So now the question is that given that capitalism has conquered our imagination and many people are willing slaves for corporations, there are very few hours left in the day and mental energy to think about all these values and degrowth. So how can we teach a corporate social climber to drop capitalism and switch to degrowth? Yeah, I think it's it's a really um, it's a really good question. I think one one way is 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 what what I talked about, which is like kind of holding up a mirror and and saying, "Do you find meaning in in, yeah. in this that that you're living, this life that you're living? It, it, are you satisfied? Um, are you satisfied with this kind of um, thing that that you're kind of reproducing?" Um, on a daily basis, um, and a lot of people, uh, if you if you look at the the skyrocketing rates of depression, of of mental health issues, even before uh, the pandemic, um, uh, isolation. Uh, you know, there are studies that show that just the amount of friendships people have are yep. are going down. Um, People see that, and and there's a really big um, recognition that what's happening, how things work, is just not okay. Um, and I think um, a lot of people respond to that feeling by becoming um, reactionary. So by by kind of actually reacting against progressive ideals, um, saying no. Like what we need to do is is keep the hierarchies in place. It, go back to uh, the traditions that we have. Go back to uh, the nuclear family and protect ourselves uh, from uh, anything that would uh, endanger that kind of um, um, more moral system. So going back to pre neoliberalism. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of people really want that. Um, and that's kind of how they approach it. But what we need to do is to make the alternative desirable, not just make it morally, uh, have a moral weight to it, but to make it um, something fun and something yep. that gives meaning and something that gives uh, a sense of satisfaction. Um, yeah. Uh, what would you say is the most playful and fun policy of degrowth? That would people just jump on board and uh, it could be anything. So I, I, I kind of, um, in, I, I wrote this article um, titled uh, Public Abundance is uh, uh, the Secret of the Green New Deal or, or the, the Secret Ingredient of the Green New Deal. Um, and I will link below for future yeah. reference, yes. Thank you. Um, something I, I kind of went through a lot of these kind of like very fun things that um, you could kind of imagine um, kind of putting in place in every single community. So, for example, and and by the way, these are all things that exist around the world already in different places. So just listing a few is, um, let's say, a library that also lends out cargo bicycles um, or 
a, a tool library where instead of having to go to Home Depot every time you need a new tool, buying it, um, maybe selling it later uh, if you don't need it anymore, you just go to your local tool library, take it out. Um, maybe you um, have to put it, give them $20 a month or something like that, but you've got all the tools you need. Um, Who would pay for this library? <laughs> I'm just curious what, what's your take on this? <laughs> well, personally, I think, yeah. you know, uh, if the local government uh, supported things like this, you'd have a lot less waste, a lot less, yep. um, uh, uh, and a lot, actually a more efficient um, society, a more efficient market, even, if you want to use those terms. And, and uh, it, there would be a lot less costs of like cleaning up um, of, of, uh, of uh, the kinds of uh, electronic waste that is generated, um, stuff like that. So it would actually be cheaper to, to do something like that. And it would be cheaper for every single person because you don't have to buy all these tools all the time. Um, Yes, if I may ask you something, I, I saw you spoke in, I think it was a master's presentation about the food waste in Canada. Has Canada mm -hmm. made any progress in, about food waste in the past few years? No, no, no nothing. <laughs> well, I haven't studied the, the problem um, as much, but the problem with food waste is it's, it's not something that um, can be solved by like tweaking the system, it's it's a problem of how industrial agriculture works. Yep. Is you have to overproduce because if you don't overproduce, then you can't guarantee that the products will appear on the shelves. Um, so it's it's a very irrational system where even if the weather conditions aren't good for let's say uh, uh, tomatoes or something like that or lettuce, um, they have to make more rather than saying okay well tomatoes don't aren't so good right now let's uh focus on something that's like maybe easier to grow um, like they have to produce it um, yeah. so is this capitalism commodifying food production essentially yeah. and yeah. do you think like okay here in the neighborhood you can build some sort of an agroecology food um, um, food cooperative like let's say neighbors can get together in, in, in Toronto and Montreal, how would they connect with, the, with, the, with farmers and producers? Do we need to establish networks or do we have them already for mm. food provisioning uh, under degrowth? That's a really good question. And I think a, a lot of people are working on that, trying to make food systems more local. I think there's a few different parts of that where one, absolutely, like we can shift our food systems so that people are more involved in their food so that there's more food available where you live and that mm -hmm. you can be part of that. Um, another part of it though, however, is um, that there is a need for some kind of uh, planning, government planning to create uh, a food system that is much more sustainable um, going beyond the kind of like individual uh, neighborhood based oh, okay th this kind of like ideal of like local food as being uh just something that kind of emerges from people's own activity like there is a need to kind of steer it into a mm -hmm. into a direction and I, I suppose it also depends on the geography and the demographic of the of the city okay Absolutely. well just one one yep. thing to know is that um until uh 2005 i, I did uh, i did um, a bit of research um, in, in Hanoi, in Vietnam. Um, so this is a, a post-communist city. Until 2005, 50% uh, of the food came from within five kilometers of the city. So That's most amazing. people were eating locally produced vegetables. And that all started to change as free trade agreements um, meant that it became better and easier for um, food to be imported, um, which also meant that farmers were being pushed to export their food at the same time. So what started as this very local food system that was highly efficient in kind of getting people what they needed 
just became this kind of like hourglass food system that's oh, much that's more centralized. So we have models for something else and it exists around the world. It has existed, um, but we need to, um, yeah, not be afraid of, of the massive change that that might involve. Yeah, yeah, that's great. All, all sounds good to me. Um, yeah, I'd like to ask you now about two of my biggest pet peeves in the, in the consumer society, which are advertising and fast fashion. Um, so uh, I know degrowth and the book talks about uh, them among many other things. How do we reduce them and eliminate them? So I, I have in mind two approaches, which is the bottom-up consumer approach. We just do, our, do it ourselves by modifying behavior. Or do we need a top-down government policy? Some people call it choice editing. So which one is better and faster? That's a really good question. And here we're getting into the socialist debates of, of government planning, of, yeah. of central planning. And, and maybe having grown up in a in a communist society, like uh, you might have uh, engaged with that a lot as well. Which is, it's a question of how do we best uh, plan towards a market that is much more rational, um, and how do we do that as a society? Um, On this note, communist Romania was also growth obsessed. They, yes. they, they, Ceausescu had the five year plan where yes. he had to double the production from the previous five years and, and bypass the West in wheat production and oil production. So it was all a, a growth competition, as the book also shows in reference to the USSR. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But there is something about those kinds of debates that were happening when people started thinking about communism as a possibility of, yep. okay. Is there a role for some kind of democratic planning where it's not an authoritarian planning, not necessarily, you know, imposed, but something that could involve this society? And probably it would require some kind of mix of, of both bottom up and top down. So, mm -hmm. you know, those that binary it isn't, you know, it kind of falls apart sometimes when you start thinking about it really. Another difficult question now, which, which is uh, the north-south uh, critique. So, okay, let's say Canadians and Europeans just, they won't change their habits. And, but then the global south will cut their access to their resources. The production goes down in the north, consumption goes down in the north. We have supply chain problems, inflation, etc. Can conflicts over this appropriation and exploitation by the north Jason Hickel talks about it a lot. Can we avoid it? And can we have a peaceful transition to degrowth, having all this history in mind? I think that kind of, it's a really good question and it's a really provocative one. I think, first of all, um, we can't necessarily say, one would hope that it would be a peaceful transition, but we can't say that it will be because let's say if one yeah. country decides to go all the way towards degrowth. So Africa says no more lithium. Yeah. 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 What do we do? <laughs> yeah. There would probably be an invasion um, yeah. or, or some kind of, uh, you know, cutting off of all uh, of all loans um, so they can no longer participate in the global market. Um, there would be massive. And, and this has happened around the world where, where societies did decolonize and say, you know, no longer. We, but they, they weren't able to fully delink themselves from the global capitalist system. At the same time, I think it brings up this question of who is the agent of history? Um, there's a lot of people will say the working class in industrial societies is the agent of history because they're the ones who have the most power because their labor uh, puts them in a position where if they refuse to do labor, then they can just bring everything to a halt. Personally, I think that this is uh, pretty misguided and, and very Western centric um, approach because um, it actually history shows that a lot of the biggest um, transformations were not just from the working class during capitalism, but also through peasant movements um, a lot of the resistance from indigenous movements is actually shaping uh, the global um, market system as well. So oh. 
Just for the, our viewers, the, um, I hear a lot of good things about Via Campesina, which is a huge global movement, and it's very much aligned with degrowth. And absolutely, yeah, and 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 so an organization like Via Campesina, or let's say an indigenous nation that refuses to have a lithium mine built on their territory, that shapes the global market as well. They are also the agents of history. So um, we could think of a kind of alignment and necessary alignment between the Western working class, the industrialized working class, and, uh, and um, the, um, these kind of global South anti-imperial movements. The book talks about uh, a very interesting example from Spain, which is the Catalan in in Integral Cooperative. Can you maybe talk a little bit about it, uh, just to inspire the North American audience <laughs> to take take up on that example? Yeah, so um, the Catalan Integral Cooperative is this very amazing um, organization that um, what first happened was um, just a very short little story. Um, this guy, Enrique Duran, who was an um, anti-austerity activist, went to different banks in Spain and kind of to prove how absurd the banking system is, he took out loans from every single bank um, that gave them to him. So he amassed like a, a, a large amount of money and then he gave it all to movements he loved and then fled the country. Um, so uh, that was basically the seed funding, if you could call it that, of um, the Robin Hood funding of um, the Catalan Integral Cooperative. Um, so they had this funding and then they said, okay, we are going to develop our own uh, cooperative that doesn't just think of itself as a uh, you know, a place where people buy stuff, but it's it's a whole economic system, like a, a network. So people will um, be able to be members of the cooperative and that allows them to get goods from other cooperatives in that network. Um, it also um, provides housing to people and it provides basic income to a group of people. And it also has its own uh, currency system. It's it's basically this, this um, this kind of like uh, building uh, the sh a new world in the shell of the old. Um, so you, it's it's an alternative that really emphasizes what a nautopia could look like. Um, it's pretty amazing. A little bit related to this uh, shorter question, um, I like this idea of time banks. Um, can you maybe elaborate how a time bank would work in a major European and North American city or, and what it is? Yeah, so a time bank is where, let's say, instead of um, counting your activity as, as in in money, like in the standard currency, you would um, count it in terms of uh, hours, let's say. And so if I if I go volunteer three hours at my local cooperative, that means that um, I get access to um, someone else's three hours in uh, somewhere else. Um, so it kind of like allows people to plug in to an alternative economy in ways that are easiest for them. Um, and there's no money exchange in the process. No money exchange in the process. Can people so, buy hours? <laughs> but, <laughs> or sell hours for money? Well, then you start getting into, uh, you start creating a new market. And I think, um, so there's a lot of examples of this um, having worked. Um, how I have to say, um, I, I think that they, they can work really well, but in most cases, there is like no institutional support. So they tend to die out pretty fast. What th that kind of signifies is that actually the money system is so powerful that it tends to just like throttle every other alternative. So I do think that time banking could be like a really cool thing to institutionalize, but historically um, they tend to have a hard time actually. Um, I think just because um, they don't have the support that they need. Um, 
Okay, so it's a, it's a matter of institutional support more than local interest, you say? I think so. Like okay. often, you know, they kind of start from, let's say, some uh, local movement and then people get involved and then they kind of fade out. But it's not an idea that should be dropped from the... No, absolutely movement. not. Okay. I, I think it's, it's, it's an idea that could go really far. Uh, and actually people, you know, already do that in a way. It's just not systematized. Um, people spend mm -hmm. countless hours volunteering at their church or, um, you know, and then uh, benefiting from some other uh, nonprofit activity somewhere else. So you could just um, in institutionalize that. Okay, so sounds good. Um, so um, I will just do a segue to, towards the end of the book because I think it ends on a, on a hopeful message. So allow me to quote uh, one of the last paragraphs. So we do not think the growth itself will develop into the social movement bringing about the urgently needed social ecological transformations. But we hope in the next counter-hegemonic cycle that larger blocks of social movements and political forces opposing both capitalist globalism and authoritarian nationalism will integrate key critiques, perspectives, and proposals from degrowth. This is the end quote. Do you see, is there a leading social movement that can adopt the tools of degrowth that can bring about the end of capitalism much faster? So it could be anything from environmental, social, labor, anything. <laughs> you don't have to pick uh, one, but uh, <laughs> your preferred uh, social movement. I mean, it goes back to this, like, who is the agent of history? Yes. Um, I would say, like, there was a study that came out or a report that came out recently that said that the largest uh, reduction in carbon emissions um, in the United States, uh, no, in, in the U.S. and Canada was due to indigenous movements uh, blocking uh, fossil fuel projects. In, in, in North America, at least, indigenous movements are, are really key um, key allies that the degrowth movement, if people are interested in degrowth, need to take seriously and need to support. So that, that's one thing. At the same time, I, I do think that like degrowth will need to be like a broad scale movement, which will have to involve unions. It will have to involve unionizing um, like more workplaces. Um, and it'll have to also involve uh, kind of like a um, you know, what they used to call a movement of movements, um, kind of a, a collaborative movement of, of many blocks that works together. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also, um, going back to the question of the Global South, it will have to involve solidarity between uh, people in industrialized government uh, countries uh, supporting and actively um, pushing forward uh, Global South movements. So for the, the last segment, I would like to ask you a few rapid fire questions. So feel free to answer yes, no, or as briefly as you can. And I will, uh, I will start with the trick question, but this is just for fun. I will not put you on the spot. Did you change your mind about green growth and believe it's better than degrowth? No. <laughs> no, you did not change your mind. That's good to hear. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> So uh, you talked about Nautopias. Is the Super Bowl a Nautopia? <laughs> or a part of a Nautopia? No. <laughs> Perfect. That's the right answer. <laughs> so um, is Bitcoin a Nautopia? And before you answer, of course, the correct answer is no. But can you imagine a way in which Bitcoin may be useful for degrowth? It would no longer be Bitcoin if it was. So Cryptocurrency, would you, maybe, yeah. okay. but not Bitcoin. So um, alternative currencies, essentially. Yes. Uh, uh, okay, so this makes me think, are there any alternative currencies, blockchain-based projects? Have you, have you, are you aware of any? Yeah, there's one that was also similarly kind of started by the same network of Catalan Integral Cooperative called the Faircoin, and they still use it and they uh, created it so that it could not be speculated on. Okay, um, so it's blockchain based. Yeah. Okay, good to hear. 
Um, next question, which one is better, non-reformist reforms or reformist non-reforms? And if you can give us an example of each. <laughs> I know you talked about it, but I uh, briefly can come up with some examples for fun. Wait, what, what would you see as a reformist non-reform? So I would say, for example, a, a buck a beer or a, a one dollar a, a ride as it was suggested in Ontario? Mm. Yes. Uh, let's say non-reformist reforms are better. Um, okay. uh, so an example of a non-reformist reform could be basic income. Um, okay. And an example of a reformist non-reform um, uh, could be, for example, um, it, here in Montreal, they're making the well, maybe that one is kind of nice, but they're making the metro free in on some Tuesdays. weekends. Yeah, some, <laughs> on some weekends on some in the days, summer. Yeah. Okay. Um, some weekends in the summer. So who who's taking those? So like the people going to work okay. uh, every day aren't it's it's for uh, vacationers, basically, or, or people. Um, but at the same time, it is this like, wait, you've been charging us this whole time and you could have just done this for free. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it does open yeah. up a, a different way of thinking. Exactly. Okay. Another, I would say cute question. Are pets an utopia? <laughs> and do you own That's pets? a really difficult question. Um, I know. I know. I have a, a, um, a Bichon poodle. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a, a dachshund who's actually yeah. sitting by my, been sitting by my feet the last hour and a half. Um, but it's it's hard because on the one hand um you could say that pets um let's say cats are the one of the main causes of biodiversity loss in in uh suburban areas um they eat their carnivores so they eat massive amounts of meat um you know they the uh, dogs as well are terrible for local wildlife um so uh, you know some people would say that they're not that great However, I think that like there's something like, for example, in like social media, it's just all about pets. Like it's just all only videos of cats and dogs. And like it does, you do notice that pets kind of allow people to broaden their consciousness <laughs> to the non-human world and yeah. to acknowledge that there is consciousness that isn't human and to identify with it. Um, so it is, it isn't. I mean, speaking as a dog owner myself, I think through my dog when I think about um, wildlife or, or when I think about um, uh, the need to have a, a society that has a better relationship with, with um, the ecosystems around it. Yeah. Maybe they're a nautopia in some way. I, I'm all on board with that, with, with the expanded consciousness of life. We can learn a lot from indigenous communities about that. Um, how can people find you and your work and maybe get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, you can. Um, I, I'm on Twitter, um, A underscore B-A-N-S-I. Basically, from there, you can find any, any kind of thing and message me as well. Thank you very much, Aaron. I hope you get, had a great time. With this and good luck with the book i'm looking forward to reading it again <laughs> i'll have to read it again to internalize all the notions and um, I, I hope we stay in touch and i hope the growth grows <laughs> thank you so much Vlad. these were incredible questions and i was very happy to be here